the other night I was in bed and because I can't scroll on my phone without playing something in the background, I put on one of my favorite comfort shows, season one of SpongeBob. And after what felt like only a few minutes, I heard a familiar sound that gave me a mini heart attack. The end credits to SpongeBob. In an instant, I was thrown back to when I was a kid and I'd pop in that beautiful orange VHS tape only to be left with an ominous, empty feeling anytime it would end. The feeling was so overwhelming that I'd often find myself physically getting up to run and turn it off, much like turning off the lights so the monster in the dark doesn't get you. Shortly after the next episode came on, I started scrolling on TikTok as I was planning on doing anyways, and like TikTok always does, it somehow read my mind, and it showed me a video that was about this exact experience. Who else was scared of the SpongeBob end credits? I'm sure some people that might tell Some guy was describing the empty feeling that he would get from the SpongeBob outro. And judging from the comments, I knew I was not alone on this feeling. Apparently, it's a well-known thing for a lot of people to be deeply disturbed by the end credit sequence to SpongeBob. And today I wanted to touch on a few explanations and theories as to why that is, and how this end credit sequence has seemingly traumatized an entire generation. Because I know that a lot of us have that same memory of falling asleep on a couch, only to wake up to some weird cartoon, ad roll, or bumper being played that has now been deeply ingrained in all of our heads. For some, it was those creepy bumpers that Adult Swim is infamous for, for others, it's the obscure Nick shows that came on at night, and for me, it was the Spongebob outro, as embarrassing as it is to admit that. I'd often fall asleep and wake up to the empty melody blasting on my TV. Suddenly, this numb feeling would overtake my body as if something was watching me, and I usually had to force my eyes closed to deal with the issue because there were times where I just wasn't brave enough to open my eyes and turn the TV off. I just let the entire ending theme play out until the deafening silence would hit, and then I'd feel even more alone than I already was. Looking back on this whole experience, I do kind of wish that there was a way to guarantee a good night's sleep for 7 year old me, because I always found myself waking up to these obscure noises or scary outros, and it's something that I used to struggle with a lot to this day. I say used to because now that I have adult money, I can afford stuff like my favorite sleeping mask. And this is a segue into today's sponsor. Now, I promise we are going to talk about why the end credit sequence is so ominous. But before that, I want everybody that falls asleep to my videos to add something to their nightly routine besides clicking play and closing their eyes. I am no stranger to sleeping masks. I've had like four to five different sleeping masks before trying Manta. And in my honest opinion, I think this is truly just one of the greatest sleeping masks that I've ever owned. They've thought of literally everything. First off, the thing that caught my eye was the uh, uh, detachable eye cups. You can literally just peel this off and then just orient it however way you want. It is incredibly easy. And this is something that just, how do you even think of that? This is how I adjusted it. Maybe this isn't the right way to do it, but I just put it on and then I just kind of stuck my fingers in and I put the eye cups where I wanted them. And you might notice on the sides, there is also headphones. There is... You move this and it just moves the headphone, the speaker, down or up. Obviously because everyone's ears are, you know, different spots. I don't use the headphones on this too much. I actually prefer having like the TV on and having the muffled noise from outside. It's perfect for that too, um, which is why I do like that these cover your ears still. I think it's, it's still a good thing to have something covering your ears because it creates that nice muffled sound. So I know that there's something playing in the background, but it's not going to be so distracting that I'm actually like going to just stay awake. And not only that, but this thing is huge. You, I, I don't think the camera does this justice. Look how big this is. This will literally fit everybody's head. Uh, now, if you want the exact model that I have, you can head over to montasleep.com. They have a wide variety of sleeping masks for all types of budgets. If you want the exact one that I have, it is the Monta Sound Sleep Mask with all the bells and whistles. But you don't really need that if you don't want to drop a lot of money on a sleeping mask. You can also get the Soak Sleep or the basic Monta Sleep Mask. They are just as good. They have the removable eye cups as well. Check out the link below because I know a lot of you watch my videos while you're sleeping. So you might as well improve that nightly routine of yours. I use this almost every night. It is an absolute staple. So I just 
massive thank you to Monta Sleep for sponsoring today's video. And without further ado, let's get back to talking about how this one end credit sequence affected an entire generation of kids. The first theory that I really, really like is the notion that our knee-jerk reaction to the end credits is actually a trauma response. Now, I don't claim to be a therapist, and I'm not giving real psychological advice here. I'm just theorizing with the tons of others online who have come to the same exact conclusion through random videos, forums, and Google searches. But the idea here is that the show was thought of as a safety net when we were kids. Like, like we got used to going to the show when our living situation got too rough, and the same way that our brain associated the cartoon with joy and happiness, it also associated the end credits with the end of that joy and happiness. Because we subconsciously knew that when this show would end, we'd have to go back to our normal life. For some, it may have been as bad as what's described in shorts like Opal, where you just have a truly chaotic living environment. So when that ending credit sequence would hit and that song would play, it just constantly left us with this empty, looming dreadfulness that filled the room whenever SpongeBob would come to an end. And, and this kind of made sense to me. It's, it makes a lot of sense to me as somebody who has defended this show's meaningfulness in other videos like my distributed music iceberg. If you've watched that, you totally understand my stance on this show. I definitely found myself going to the show a lot as a kid whenever I felt that the stress of my environment was just too much. And I could totally see how on some level, my little eight-year-old brain forged an association between the end credits playing and my fun time ending. But that's just one possible explanation for this. I did mention that we were going to be discussing a few theories that speculate on how exactly this end credit song manages to create such a strong presence. One thing we should consider when trying to figure out how this song can possibly be interpreted as unnerving is dissonance. Some people have theorized that it's the actual notes that are being played that causes something in people's brains to interpret the song through this creepy lens. I'm no music genius and I don't claim to be, but a lot of people have expressed how most of the notes in the song are played in a minor key and that the song bounces between the notes in such a way that don't really go well together, creating dissonance, which to our ears translates to that uneasy feeling that others have described when hearing the outro. I think to the untrained ear, it's easy to interpret this song in such a manner. Even something as simple as just listening to the song through a different lens can elicit this response. Another song that I think can be used as a good analogy here is Tiny Tim's Tiptoe Through the Tulips. On the surface, this song is honestly quite a beautiful piece, but play it in the right setting and suddenly it's the creepiest song on earth. That's why for this video's intro, I decided to put the Spongebob outro in the setting that I thought would easily get across how I felt as a kid. And it's at this point that I think we should touch on one detail, the setting, the, the environment, and the confirmation bias that has led many of us to associating the song with this unnerving experience. As I said earlier, most of us only remember hearing the outro in the dead of night. You'd fall asleep at your bedtime, which for me was around 8 p.m., and you'd wake up at like 2 a.m. to the sound of the SpongeBob outro while you were most likely alone on the couch with no one around. Whether your family was in their rooms or not, it felt incredibly disturbing to be alone while this dissonant sound would emit from the TV. Like the intro, just imagine walking alone in your house and the TV turns on while blurring this sound. It's just extremely creepy and makes you feel like something is out there in the void watching you. As if something around you is off. And I don't think it's just the Spongebob outro that brings forth this experience. I think tons of media has made me feel this way. I've gone over this exact feeling in my Disturbing Media series, specifically on the segment on unfinished game levels. I described this empty feeling I'd get when I'd play a game like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and how it felt when the in-game music would just randomly stop playing. Riding around each level with nothing but the sound of your skateboard and the occasional car made the world feel empty. And that same alone feeling would overtake me every single time this happened. 
and this rang true for many other games that I'd use action replay or cheat codes on. Whether I glitched out of the map on Pokemon Diamond to catch some legendary, or if I wanted to play an unfinished level from Kingdom Hearts, they would all emit the exact same uneasy aura. And what's crazy to me is there are some people in the world who just truly do not understand this sentiment at all. There's those who hear the SpongeBob outro and get incredibly nostalgic to the point of wanting to put the show back on, describing the happiness and joy that they can remember feeling from watching it as a kid. And I'm sure that some of those people are watching this exact video, trying to understand those who get disturbed by something as silly as the SpongeBob outro. And for those select few that are watching this because of that, I think you're incredibly lucky. And, and I personally just think it's crazy because when I hear this outro, I often get thrown back to all of the chaos that made up my childhood. You know, obviously, it's not always bad. I do love the show. And it is kind of nice here and there to get reminded of SpongeBob, especially with how big it is in meme culture. Because I'm sure that many of you can relate to hearing a sound on TikTok that is taken directly from the show and immediately firing up Prime Video or YouTube to relive the first few seasons once again. It's only after that episode comes to an end that we all get thrown back and get to relive the end credit sequence that managed to traumatize an entire generation. Now, if you made it here and you made it to the end of today's video, thank you for watching all the way through. A lot of people just kind of skip over the outro. I do have a lot of updates and stuff whenever I do these kinds of outros. And right now, I just wanted to say that I'm just excited. Um, I think right now, uh, I'm like super motivated to get this other video done that I've been doing. I am currently four, or my, it might be five books actually. I am five books in on my Junji Ito uh, deep dive. I put this off for like a few months. I did mention in like a Twitter post a long time ago that I was doing this and having Wendigoon post his like recently, I was like, I need to hurry this video up before he gets to it for me, to be honest. Cause I've been planning this for a long time since like November, basically, even before then I wanted to do this video. Um, but yeah, I'm about like five books in right now. I read literally two of them like today. So this is like the third one that I was gonna read today. And I am just grinding right now, just trying to get that done because I have so much to say about Junji Ito. I've read a lot of his other Japanese stuff um, and obviously I had it translated. I don't speak Japanese or read Japanese um, in case anyone's <laughs> wondering that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I love the guy's work and I'm excited to get that done. Um, but as far as these kinds of videos go, um, I, I'm re-watching It's Such a Beautiful Day. Uh, the reason that video hasn't come out, in all honesty, is just because... I just kind of reevaluated my opinion on it, and I feel like the original video that I had just did not really fit what I wanted to say about it. So I, I'm only going to put out stuff that I really believe in. So I'm going to redo that and then have it out come out when it, when it comes out. I, I like these videos doing coming out when I want, when I think that they are good enough to be consumed by whoever wants to watch them. But yeah, uh, feeling motivated again. <laughs> Uh, start of the year was crazy and yeah, this year is going to be awesome. I, I, um, I truly believe this is just going to be an, an amazing year for me and the channel and the community and I'm excited. I got some big stuff planned. Even if the collaborations I have in mind don't really pull through, I, I'm definitely just going to end up doing those videos by myself anyways. And yeah, so I just wanted to give a humongous thanks to all the support that I've been getting and yeah, it is time for the patron shout out, as I always do at the end of these videos. If you are on screen, thank you so much for continuing to support me. The, the people that are on screen supported me through like the three month hiatus that I took and, and I cannot be more thankful. There's more people that are like the lower tiers and, and I do have like the $10 tier is like the only one that gets on screen. And I might change that soon just because I think it's it's good to have everybody on screen that supports me. But it's everyone that has stayed on the Patreon. I, I You don't have to. And you do. Every month. Uh, and it, it does help. Even though I think it's dropped from like 300 bucks to like 100 bucks. It's That's literally like, like bills to me. So it, it really helps no matter like how little or how much. Or even just watching the videos is enough. Like just watching me upload and stuff. 
and I, I get to do this dream job that I've wanted since I was like eight. So thank you. you everyone that's watching doesn't understand. Even if my community is super small, it's it means the world to me that I'm able to do this. And yeah, I, that's all I want to say. I, it might start tearing up or something. So yeah, I will see you all in the next video. I, again, I just I have a lot, a lot of things coming soon and, uh, and I'm excited and it's going to be super sick to get everything out. So with all that said, I will see you all in the next video. Thanks for watching.